Okay, um, I just had a thing, Anita, because Love people it. won't be able to comment where they are, that you can tell people to just do what I did and rename themselves um, and put which country they're on in their name. Oh, that takes time and they'll be okay. fiddling around. Okay. They'll be fiddling around with, with their actual preference stuff doing that, don't you think? You All you have to do is right click and press rename. I, if, if you want, though, I will send those to Anita. So, okay. so, so anyway, I mean, I don't even have enough time to read it out. I, I, I think it's good if we can see them down the side. I actually think it's good for people to see everybody else and where they're going, but you, you've got it all yeah, private. I can, I can share it with everybody. As soon as they send it to me, I can share them with everybody. Why can't, we, why can't messages all just be open, Chrissy? Because then some people, if someone's a troll, then yeah. they're... Oh, like, okay. troll. We, we can't risk it, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to let everyone in. Okay. Thank you. Here they come. Okay, here they come. Oh my god. <laughs> Stampede. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> We've opened the doors to Avid Reader yeah. and they are streaming through the doors. Oh my god, James, Nika, Cody, Jackie. So there are more people Anthony, coming through Anthony. the door. Wow. Anthony Mullins. David. <laughs> There's Donna Weeks Hello. in Japan. Hello. And my cat so as well. Faith. Katie Woods. Sorry. Oh my god. Wow. Fiona. Hi. Felicity. Hello. Mindy. Julie. This is exciting. <laughs> Laura. Jim Higgins. Hello, Jim. Big avid fan. It's Madonna. <laughs> Alex Adset. Hello. Is this Dr. Sandy? Oh, this is exciting. Anna and Omar. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Jenna. Oh, the Carmichael's. Hello, Leanne Revenge. Hello, Cuz. Bunch of people still streaming through the door here at Avid Reader. It's going to be a big night. And uh, we're just, we've just imagined that it's, it's actually quite a chilly night here in Brisbane. And um, we are opening the doors and people are streaming in they have you know glasses of wine and glasses of juice and dip and crackers and cheese i'm in the wrong house <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's all happening here because we're still there are still people joining us wow it's megan McGrath. And I know Anthony Mullins is in the other room watching, but Anthony Mullins, your cat is going to distract me over here. So I might get him to remove the cat. It's Davis. Katie Woods, our old friend. This is just like a reunion. It is. Verena South. Oh, wow. This is great. All right. All right, we have quite a few people in the room now, and I might, even though I'm still admitting people as we go, I'm going to um, I'm going to start just telling you about some technical things before we start. Firstly, is um, as we're letting people through, um, you have a couple of if you haven't used um, Zoom before, there are a couple of ways you can look at tonight. They're up in the top right hand corner. Um, there's a little kind of lot of um, squares and you can tap those squares and you can either see the speaker full on the screen or you can see like the Brady Bunch, a whole bunch of little faces. Now it's up to you how you watch it, but I do recommend the speaker view with the speaker taking up the whole of the screen because um, it's a little bit less distracting, but feel free just to um, wander around and watch everybody else instead. <laughs> That's completely fine too. Um, also that your microphones are all turned off um, that's so that it, there's less disrupt, disruption to the event tonight. But um, there is a chat function. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little box that um, says chat. And feel free to use that to chat with, every, um, to chat with me. And those messages will come to me. Um, and I will take questions through that chat function. 
and um, I will relay those questions at the end of the night. Um, look, there's still more to come, but as um, just because um, we, we don't want to delay too much, um, I just thought that I, I'll start and I'll hand over. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that um, we're meeting on in my area, the Yenkara and the Turrbal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any other Elders who are here tonight. Um, and I'm very, very excited to be here for the launch of this incredibly beautiful, beautiful book um, because Ellen is one of my dearest um, friends and also one of the best writers that I know. Um, and I am um, inc feel incredibly, incredibly privileged to have watched Ellen's work um, grow over the years. And I really do think this is the most mature of Ellen's books. Um, an incredible book. Um, it's so powerful and so gentle at the same time. And I have no idea how they managed to do two things at once like that. But yes, I'm really, really personally very proud of this book and I recommend it to everybody. It is something you should have on your bedside table at the moment. It will be um, good for the soul, I believe. Um, look, I'm going to start by um, introducing you to um, Auntie Colleen Wall who is a senior Kabi woman and elder in residence at QPAC. Um, I'd like everybody to please welcome Auntie Colleen as um, she does the acknowledgement of country. Welcome to Auntie Colleen. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honoured to give an acknowledgement to country tonight for Ellen. Nyara, Maruba, Yaman, Kari, Ellen, Dali, Kari, Yippee. Hello. Happy to speak for Ellen today for throat. That's my language, my Kabi language. Um, Juka, our Aboriginal land law, requires lawful behaviour on country. So as a senior Dower Kabi woman, I must pay respects to the ancestors of the country where we meet today. On behalf of all of you out there today, linking in through our sacred Viri Sky Spirit networks, I pay respects to the spiritual ancestors of your lands, as well as those of the Turrbal Yarrabal lands here in Brisbane. I say to them, Dimbulagari, we meet in friendship on your land. My Marung spirit, my blood tie to country, is through Kovai B Nation of the Mary River. So I first acknowledge Kutha, the bee of Mount Kutha, who is, my cousin, who is the cousin of my ancestor Kovai B. I pay respects to the bee ancestors on your lands. I pay respects to Kunava, the freshwater dreaming spirit as it travels along the rivers, the veins of our mother earth and revitalizes our sacred water holes and springs. I pay respects to Marin, the Gwena, my personal Marung. I give respect to all the Gwena spirits on your country. I pay respects to Dawa Stringybark, my clan Marung. I pay tribute to all the special tree spirits across this great land and especially on your lands. I acknowledge Yon Galba, the songline travelways throughout our sacred lands that carry Mother Earth's sacred land laws. I ask all ancestral spirits from our respective lands to keep us safe and well in good spirit, both mentally and physically at this time. I ask them to keep our individual creative spirits flowing strong so we can continue telling our stories within our respective genres and support us in our isolation. Lastly, I say Nyara, welcome. May today bring Maruba Ninda, good spirit and harmony to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and on that note, I will pass on to Aviva Tuffield. Um, Aviva is the publisher at the University of Queensland Press um, and had a very good taste to pick up this book, which um, is actually amazing. Aviva, welcome. Thank you, Chrissy, And thank you, Auntie Colleen, for your beautiful words. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Boon peoples of the Kulin Nation as the tra traditional custodians of the land from which I'm Zooming tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to thank the champions at Avid Reader for all they are doing to support authors, publishers and readers during this time of social distancing. Their community engagement is world class. 
They deserve our support in return. So don't forget to order a copy or three of Throat from them to show your appreciation. Well, what to say about Ellen Van Nierven? Ellen came onto my radar when their story collection, Heat and Light, was shortlisted for the Stella Prize. I read it and thought, who is this remarkable author? And what an exceptional imagination and prowess of language they have. So as Ellen can attest, from that point on, my sights were pretty much set on them and their work. And I can be somewhat single-minded in my focus. Ellen calls me the determined Aviva and the acknowledgements of this splendid collection. But we both know that's just a polite way of saying relentlessly pushy and pest. During. I wouldn't want to alarm anyone about the extent of my stalking, uh, I mean fandom, but let's just say that for a while there I managed to regularly bump into Ellen in the Brunswick City Bus changing rooms, but in my defence I have been a member there for years. When I joined UQP and continued campaign Van Nierven, as I didn't call it, and asked Ellen what they were working on currently, and they mentioned some new poems, a few of which I'd read elsewhere, and then this perfect collection appeared. The poems in Throat are fierce, funny, brave, political, intimate and personal. And as always with Ellen's work, speak to family and community. They give voice to so many and to so much that mainstream Australia tries to silence. In a recent segment on Away on ABC's Radio National that I cannot recommend highly enough that you seek out, Ellen talks about being bullied from the age of about four to the age of 17 and not speaking up then. But as they point out, watch out for them quiet ones. It turns out that they might grow up like Ellen to be future warrior po poets of the marginalized. UQP is so proud to publish Ellen Van Nierven and we're delighted when Quentin Bryce selected Throat as the inaugural recipient of the UQP Quentin Bryce Award. I think that gives you some idea about the breadth of this special book's appeal. Congratulations on Throat, Ellen, and all the amazing actors blades and praise this collection is already receiving and I know will continue to do so. The world is a better place with this book in it. Speaking of things the world is improved by, it's time to introduce the incomparable Dr. Anita Heiss, who has kindly agreed to be in conversation with Ellen here tonight. Anita is a proud member of the Wiradjuri Nation of Central New South Wales. She is the author of works of non-fiction, historical fiction, commercial women's fiction, poetry, social commentary and travel articles. She is a professor of communications at the University of Queensland, a lifetime ambassador of the Indigenous Literacy Foundation, and a member of the UQP board. Over to you, Professor Heiss. Mandangu Aveva. Iridu Marang, you and do Yanada Heiss, Baladu Radri Gailang, Arabijibu Brangliubu, Megandi Bala Williams, Ninimaradu, Yagaragu, Turubugu, Mianjingu, Mangu and Mandungu to Auntie for the welcome and acknowledgement to country. My name is Anita Heiss. Uh, good evening, everybody. I have where I drew belonging from Arambi and from Brungle Missions in central New South Wales. I'm a Williams. Uh, Yindamara is a Wiradjuri phrase meaning to pay honour and respect. So I pay my respects this evening to traditional owners of country and caretakers here in Mianj in Brisbane and uh, Mandangu is thank you um, for all of you being here this evening and for the absolute honour to be able to share in the release and joy and celebration of uh, my dear friend Ellen's latest um, collection of poetry. We know that there are people with us this evening from around Australia. The upside of COVID is that we can share via Zoom so much more. Um, around Australia and also internationally. So it would be great, Ellen and I were interested to know who's with us this evening. If you could put in the chat function whose country you're on, that'd be great, or whatever city you, you are in around the world, it'd be, we'd like to know where, where you are tonight. It really is a great pleasure for me to be here with Ellen. Um, for me as a writer, for me as a reader, but also as a proud sister of the award-winning writer of uh, Mananjali and Dutch Heritage. I'm a huge fan of Ellen's words on the page, but then again, so are many others, which is why you're all with us this evening. Um, Ellen has been described by Melissa Lukashenko, who I'm sure many of you have also read, as a young writer of immense potential. The Australian Book Review has said that Ellen produces writing with a rare and imaginative force. In 2013, Ellen won the David Nikon Award for an Unpublished Indigenous Writer in the Queensland Literary Awards for her short story collection, Heat and Light. 
In addition to the Inaipon Award, the collection has won the Doby Award and the Indigenous Writers' Prize in the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. It was also shortlisted for a swag of other awards, which I won't list, but it was shortlisted for the prestigious Stella Prize. Her second book, uh, poetry collection, Comfort Food, was published in 2016. Many of you may have been at that launch in Avid Reader um, in West End. And that was shortlisted for the Kenneth Slessor Poetry Prize in the New South Wales Literary Awards. Um, I wanted to say uh, most recently, I think, I don't know, Evie, did you mention, sorry, that UQP also announced the inaugural Quentin Bryce Award this year, which also went to Ellen Van Nieven for her collection of Throat. And I wanted to say I love the cover. We love the cover. It's on my T-shirt. You can get a T-shirt yourself um, if you email, if you put in the chat room um, where, you want, where you want one and Chrissy will send you back the details about that. Um, in terms of reading Throat, I think many people are going to read it as they do with lots of poetry collections and novels and so forth and come away having been touched spiritually, emotionally, um, intellectually with certain poems that will speak to you and that you will say, my favourite poem is this. When I sat on my couch here in West End and read, um, read Throat for the first time, there were a number of lines that jumped off the page for me and I just wanted to share some of those specific lines. They're not in any particular order and they're completely out of context, but this is what they are. Most of them spoke to me personally. There seems nothing left to do but write. Every chant is a line of a continuing poem and I am learning the words. This country is a haunted house. Government still playing cat chasing marsupial mouse. I found out Indigenous studies has nothing to do with me. Wish those pollies would start their speeches with, every, sorry, I wish those pollies would start their speeches with, everything I'm gonna say from here on in is a lie. My my tongue hurts from all the things I have said, all the things I haven't. All my crushes have been books. She asks me how I feel when I wake and she is all I feel. My heritage is to honour those in my blood. And finally, white excellence should be a filter on Tinder. For those of you on Tinder. With those lines and so much more in mind, thank you, Ellen, for your gift of words, for your gift of poetry, and for sharing with us all tonight. I thought it might be nice for you to open uh, our Q&A with a poem before we get into a whole lot of questions and answers. So over to you, Ellen. Jingari Jimbalang, I'm on Yagara and Turbul Dagan. I'm Mullen Jali from the Yugumba Language Group, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is uh, Logan, Gold Coast and Scenic Rim in Southeast Queensland. Um, my dad is Dutch. He's from a uh, Van Leeuwen family, which are from the south of the Netherlands, a village called Milo. And my mum is Mullen Jali and she's belongs to the Currys and the Williams, uh, two big families um, in Southeast Queensland, Brisbane. Um, I am gonna read a poem to start, but firstly, I'd like to make some uh, quick thank yous. Um, firstly, um, a big thank you to Annie Cole for setting us off with that beautiful acknowledgement. Um, I really feel like the spirits are happy now and we can do our business now. So thank you so much for joining us today. It was really beautiful to have your voice. Um, and I, I just want to say it's so great to see all of your faces, everyone that's joining in today. I had to shut it off gallery view for a second because I was so distracted by all of your gorgeous faces, uh, my family, my kin, my community, my friends, my mentors, teachers, students, teammates, and colleagues. It's so good to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to thank Avid Reader, uh, particularly Fiona, um, 
for hosting this event. Um, Avid have been a big support of my work um, since the beginning for about a decade now where I did my first readings um, at Avid and um, we're up to book number three now. Um, speaking of a constant, consistent supporter, Chrissy Neem, um, such a pleasure. You've been at all of my launches and every single one you give me a beautiful um, bouquet of flowers, which you can see at the back. Um, thank you for being such a beautiful friend. And also thank you to Anthony and Heathcliff, your family. Um, I just want to say thank you, Anita, for agreeing to do this. I love you. I have so much admiration for you. And you are the person that I wanted to launch this book. And I'm so glad you agreed to it. Thank you. Um, uh, Aviva, thank you for your speech on behalf of UQP. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, thank you to Lou from UQP for helping to organize this event. Thank you everyone at UQP. Thank you to my two editors, Felicity and Kathy. I got to work with you again. I'm so lucky. It's such a privilege. And thank you to everyone who has bought a copy of the book already um, or plans on buying a book. This book is no longer mine. It is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, just a little bit of context to um, the poem. And it's beautiful because Chrissy's texting me where you guys all are. You're all acknowledging country and she's um, emailing me, not sorry, messaging me where you all are, which is great. It's a bit distracting, Chrissy, but. <laughs> I was messaging everyone in the, in the room, but I'll do it later. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's good to see where you all are. Mm -hmm. Um, but a little bit of context to this first poem that I'm going to read. Um, so this book wrote, was written over a four-year period and two of those years were spent um, in Kulin country where Aviva is in so-called Melbourne or Nam, which is a cooler name for Melbourne. And, um, you know, I see some Melbourne friends on this chat, which is really great. Um, uh, I was there... In 2017, when um, the HSC incident happened, and uh, I was no stranger to uh, online abuse before that. I'd got uh, the odd, odd message here and there, but this was like a concentrated thing where over the period of like, say, 48 hours, just kept getting this like barrage of messages, emails, private messages, um, like hundreds of death threats and abusive messages. Um, and I had to turn my phone off because it was blowing up because uh, someone had leaked my uh, number to media. And so, you know, people wanted me to come on radio, television, that sort of thing. And I was also, but at the same time, I was getting really, a lot of really beautiful supportive messages as well. But at the time it was just very overwhelming and, the first feeling was shock because I didn't know that my poem was going to be used on 2017 HSC, so I had no idea what was happening. Um, and I was getting I was getting messages from high school kids, but mostly adults. Um, so a mixture of students and adults. Uh, and uh, after that initial wave of shock, um, I started to feel really angry and um i just felt angry that um because i refused to accept that that's um what happens i refuse to accept abuse just because we may be first nations we may be outspoken we may be lgbtiq um just for being who we are i think it's uh totally unacceptable to expect that when we put ourselves in an online space or a physical space that we um, are going to receive um, abuse and uh, vilification. Um, and so that was a real, yeah, it was a real kind of interesting point in I just, I, I was only about six months living in a new city and I was feeling 
homesickness and I really should have went home then. I really should have went back to Mianjin, back to community, back to family, back to friends. Um, but I wanted to stick it out and um, uh, I kind of went through this period where I wasn't feeling so great with my mental health and I was very hard on myself. I wasn't very loving towards myself and I kind of only know that now because, you know, you can go back and be like, oh, I wish I, you know, I wish I was nicer to myself. I wish I knew that, you know, it was okay to do all the things, you know, do what I needed to do. Um, but uh, whenever I felt my lowest, uh, I could always, you know, if there was whatever was going on, I could always think about my connection to country, my spiritual connection to country, think about, uh, the Logan Albert Rivers, Brisbane River. Um, I could think about those mountains when you start driving out to Bo Desert Way. Think about like the storms, the air, the dirt, the taste, the smell, the birds, the trees, uh, the water. And that would give me so much strength. And um, I could find my way back from there. And so this is what this poem's about. It's me in that state being in, um, I'm never too far away from home in my mind, no matter where I am, but I am in, um, on the lands of the Kulin Nation in this poem. I was called, I used to have a name for this. I'm a long way from Mullanjali land. Gum leaves under my pillow, smuggled interstate by mouth. They're crinkled and get smaller each day. I want to grow and get better, but I trip, love misery, care too much, always since school, when my first light introduced me to music. And I fell into their shadow as I fall now into yours. I used to have a name. I want to relax again. Our places are nothing flash. QV and that kebab shop on Sydney Road. I'm drawn there as if memory can save me, as if all I need is one deep, long sniff of you and everything will be good. Tonight, my friend called my heart a marathon runner and me, a chain smoker who refuses to quit even when their organ shut. I think she meant it as a compliment. Paths are printed in my blood. When my hope breaks, I'll have the river. That's beautiful, Ellen. Thank you so much for that introduction to your work. And you, you touch on obviously one of your themes, which is place, mm -hmm. which we'll come back to shortly. But I wanted to just ask first, you open the collection with a quote by uh, Patience Agbabi, and it goes like this. No one's found until they find themselves hurting in the back of the throat. So let's go straight to the title then, which is throat, because titles do matter mm. to authors and we can back and forth with our publishers about uh, what we want, what they want and what marketing wants. So what, tell us a little bit about the title of Throat, please. I love the title of Throat. I'm a big kind of fan of like, double meanings or triple meanings or quadruple meanings. You know, I feel like it's something that symbolizes a lot of things. You know, it can symbolize the power of speech. Um, it's something that can symbolize pleasure, symbolize pain. And also uh, I mentioned, there's a mention in the book to the black throated finch, uh, which has uh, become like a bit of a symbol um, in the uh, Adani, the fight against, and see a Dani Carmichael mine in North Queensland. Um, the black throated finch is a beautiful bird. Uh, it's already endangered. It's lost 88% 88, 88 of its natural habitat. Um, and we need to protect our country, you know, we need to protect animals. And so, you know, environmental themes are a big part of this book because, you know, mm -hmm. if we, as you know, Anita, my sister, if we, if our country is not well, we mm -hmm. as people are not well. Very true. Thank you for that. So just moving into this, five distinct sections to the collection, 
I'm just going to read the titles out for those who are here tonight who don't have a copy yet. So uh, section one is they haunt walk in. Two is whiteness is always approaching. Three, I can't wait to meet my future genders. Four is speaking outside. And five is take me to the back of my throat. Can you just tell us a little bit about how uh, the, distinct, the distinctions between those, those sections in the collection? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love to run you through these five sections. Uh, they're all quite layered. We've, um, you know, had so many influences and so many inspirations um, to this book. So starting with number one, they haunt walk in. Um, I got the concept of haunting. Um, my beautiful sister, I think she's on tonight, um, our beautiful sister, Natalie Harkin, um, such an inspiration, such a beautiful poet. Um, she uh, got me onto the works of Crowley Driscoll, who's a Cherokee two-spirit writer, and they write a lot about uh, haunting. And Natalie herself, you know, as First Nations peoples, we are haunted peoples. Um, we carry the past with us. Um, we kind of sort of live in, in a kind of haunted world. Um, and Natalie's also introduced me to the term blood memory. This is uh, Natalie's book, one of, one of the sections of Natalie's book. Um, and in it, she writes, there is memory in the blood and it doesn't always flow easily. Mm -hmm. So I was really just uh, extending, well, not extending, but sort of, I was inspired by thinking about uh, memory and haunting. And that's how I wanted to start off my work uh, kind of, you know, kind of unpacking that a little bit, mm -hmm. um, very much in, you know, following on from what had been done before me. Um, similarly, whiteness is always approaching, takes some cues from Claudia Rankin's work, who's one of my favourite writers, African-American writer, beautiful, powerful woman. Um, and she writes a lot about whiteness um, and just a quote from her she says how do you understand white privilege if you don't understand that you're white if you don't understand that racism is actually about how whiteness functions inside the culture mm -hmm. so i thought i'd turn my attention onto whiteness because so often as first nations peoples we are studied we are pulled apart we are analysed. So I kind of thought, you know, it'd be good to, like, turn it upside down. So in this section, I look at uh, white supremacy, white privilege, white guilt, white excellence. Like, there's one of my favourite poems is about, like, my version of, like, how to be a good white person, uh, which I think you quoted from earlier, Anita, uh, with that Tinder line. And I wrote some of that section while I was in Europe and I saw things from a different angle. I saw how extractive colonization had influenced uh, the way that Europe looked uh, and what it is today and how some of these cities had been built around making the, you know, manipulating the water, making sure that the ships could come in and bring all of that wealth that they extracted from the colonies and to be able to build the cities that they have today. Uh, so it was it was quite quite fascinating for me to write about all of those themes. Um, okay, section number three. I can't wait to meet my future genders. That's also I loved also writing that section. It's about celebrating the diversity of genders uh, beyond the male female binary. Uh, celebrating um, myself as someone who recently identifies as gender fluid. Um, embracing that and writing about gender as being a colonial construct. You know, uh, we so often see gender through a very white gaze. So kind of unpacking that, talking about, you know, being in South, Southeast Asia and kind of talking about some conversations I had about gender there. Section number four, speaking outside, took my cues from Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. Have you read that, Anita? I'm, no, I'm I haven't. Sure. I've seen that one Sure, you've read some I'm more. Like, hey, um, <laughs> like, this is not well, a test. <laughs> um, she was writing about intersectionality before it became such a buzzword like it is today. Um, and in that book are some 
seminal essays. Poetry is not a luxury. I'm sure some of you have read it. Um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And my favorite essay of hers is uses, uses of the erotic, the erotic as power. And yeah, and when, what Lord, Lord is talking about, she's not just talking about, you know, the erotic as like how we might think about it, like a physical thing. She's talking about it as some sort of magic or like untapped power that women have, like a show of resistance in the face of a racist, patriarchal and homophobic society. And this is a beautiful quote from her where she says, when I speak of the erotic, I speak of it as an assertion of the life force of women, of that creative energy empowered, the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work and our lives. Um, speaking of reclaiming language, in that section, I've written a letter to my Nana in Yugumbe. So beautiful, like this was through the help of um, Sean Davis, helped with some of those interpretations, um, my cousin. And, you know, like to be able to like write in that mother tongue, like it's just really special, really special. And I'm sure it's like something that I'm gonna kind of keep doing, like writing language. I think it's really important. Um, last section, take me to the back of the, take me to the back of my throat. Um, this is just like where I'm just like, okay, you've passed the test. I'm ready to tell you all my secrets. You know, we've gotten through this far. Um, it's where uh, I feel, you know, my most vulnerable work is in that last section because I feel like the reader has earned it. I'm thinking, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the clock and I'm imagining there's so many questions. Mm -hmm. I've got more questions. I'm just so conscious of time. Also a white construct. Um, can, and just so people know, they can be sending their questions to yep. Chris via the chat thing because Will be, this is the only event that Ellen's doing that has a Q&A um, component to it. So do make, make use of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the themes. Well, you've touched on nearly all your themes already. Obviously, we're talking about love and language and, as we mentioned previously, place. Uh, I love there's a special tribute in our collection to Chermside, Chermy. So I'm sure, is there any, can I get a, see a thumbs up? from people who actually have a bit of a connection or um, to Chermside or a fondness for Chermside. I'm just wondering, seriously though, Ellen, can you talk about why, um, obviously I understand, many of us understand connection to country and purpose for us, but talk about why place features so much in your yeah, poetry. of course. And I, with that Chermy poem, Anita, I took a bit of, a, um, bit of my cues from you because I, I remember you describing yourself once as a, concrete curry with a Westfield dreaming. So um, definitely talking about how, you know, we as Blackfellas, we have those connection to urban space as well as, as natural mm -hmm. space. You know, I just, I kind of, I can't not write about Southeast Queensland, you know, it's, it's like in my blood. I'm so like proud of being um, from this country and, um, and my family and, and ancestors. And so I kind of, it's just something that I keep continuing and, and keep honouring in my work. Well, can I say, we were all very happy when you went to Melbourne, but we we're all very glad that you came back to where you belonged. So thank you for yeah. that. Now, yeah. just moving, I want to move on to something serious now, because talking about various forms of um, violence against First Nations people is a very sensitive and a very challenging thing to do but it's a very important thing for you particularly I know um, as a writer to to do that in your work and I, I would like you to tell us walk us through how you approach writing about violence in your poetry mm, there's so many like different types of violence I guess like there's colonial violence uh, the genocide uh, or the attempted genocide which is ongoing because um, there's, there's still dispossession of land that's happening and the prevention of us uh, or that the, they try to prevent us from practicing culture and uh, being able to look after country. Um, 
there's also uh, you know deaths in custody um, which is something that unfortunately has affected I think every Aboriginal person I know has a family member which is so unacceptable um, it's 2020 um, I write a lot about uh, gendered violence um, there's two poems, one's dedicated to uh, Miss Do and one's dedicated to Miss Daly, uh, two beautiful First Nations women that should still be alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I write about homophobia, transphobia um, and lateral violence, uh, which is something that I hesitated to include in my book, but I think it's important to talk about how sometimes we go after our own. And I guess the four ways that I choose to write about violence is you know first is that honoring so honoring um people that have uh, been influenced by violence and lost their lives to violence um truth telling um satire is something that I, I do a lot and yeah like I mentioned before vulnerability I feel like if you're going to come on the journey with me um as a reader I also have to make myself vulnerable mm-hmm. and I also have to critique myself um and yeah so that, I think that's kind of some of the ways that I chose to address there's um, a couple of so this thank you for that there's a couple of things we'll come back to one of them is first of all dedications there's a lot of dedications um in your collection so there's um obviously to your mum the library woman Omar Nana and of course you mentioned Miss Do and uh, the tragic story of her of her death um Auntie Mel Jimmy Everett, Nani Patsy Cameron from down Tasmania, also Destiny Deacon, the artist. And I'm wondering if there's a couple of questions there, and I, I haven't framed these very well in my head, but one is about how important it is for you, how important is it for you to honour people uh, in in your life or who influenced you through your writing? And do you and how much inspiration do you find from actual other people you know? I think that's vital. Sense. I think uh we do that it's like part of our nature to honor you know who who comes before us who's helped us be the people that we are uh, our elders um, our influences and this book uh, came after the loss of um, two really deadly women um, Annie Linda and Annie Carey who we both we both we lost them both last year they were both immense men- mentors for me uh, and I really felt them um, with me when I was writing this book and I think you know in our writing we we carry people in that in our in our works yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and here's well, Annie, Car- Annie Carey I just want to I think she well we don't I could talk about my own relationship with Kat, but I think she's impacted every, not nearly every single First Nations writer that I know has had some form of relationship or influence by uh, from Kerry. So, and and her legacy will live on in in your work and in every, in all of our work. So, Absolutely. I wanted, sorry, I wanted to um, I wanted to flag something with the with our viewers this evening, our potential readers and our readers who may not have your book. But in uh, in your collection, you you flag the idea of signing a treaty with your reader, and I kid you not, those who have not seen this yet, if you turn to page sixty, I don't know if you can see that, but you'll see. Oh, Ellen's got it. Yeah, you can see. Thanks, Ellen. You can actually sign a treaty with Ellen. Um, I'd like you to sign it, photograph it, tweet it. Instagram it but seriously Ellen can you tell us what it means what you know and I think there's a poem attached to that I, th- I think it may be useful if you read the poem as well mm. so yeah what is yeah. it I'm like pretty kind of, with your reader yeah totally okay firstly yeah like um you know our, our people have been fighting for a treaty uh forever you know like as soon as uh white fellas came you know and um you know, Arnie, Arnie Carey's words, um, you know, when people think, you know, why why do you want a treaty? What, you know, white, white fellas might be like, you know, what what's a treaty? What What is this about? Uh, Arnie Carey said, I believe we need to have a treaty. We need to have that more than anything. We need some recognition in this country that there were Aboriginal people prior to Cook 
We need to make a legal binding document with the Australian government and the Australian people that gives us some rights, some power and some equality in this land. Now, in absence of a treaty, we don't have treaty, but I thought I would write, I thought I'd do a little, this is an agreement, this is a treaty between the author, myself and the reader, which are you guys. Um, and uh, there's some, you know, there's some uh, guidelines that I've written um and i'll just i love it i'll, I'll I love read it, it. I, I wanted to disrupt the reading experience i wanted people to be like halfway through the book be like what's this and like it's something it's definitely something i haven't seen in a book before so yeah i'm glad you like it um i don't want this to go into the pile of broken treaties if there is a need to formalize a relationship between the parties i'd like to do so in poetry English is a requisite language of this treaty, but ideally the agreement would be tabled in Jugendberg. Here we recognize my country was invaded, not civilized. We recognize my sovereignty and agree that I exist independently of the Australian government and I'm capable of entering agreements without government intervention. I'm not sure whom I'm entering into this agreement with. Are you white fella, black fella, or fella of another country, color? Whose country do you belong to and whose do you occupy? What is our relationship with each other? What are our expectations of each other? Does this treaty cover the time you spend with this book or does it go further? What of UQP's claim? Does the fact that I've entered into an agreement with a non-Indigenous owned publisher complicate this treaty? What about the non olinjali Yugumba people employed in the production of this book? Does their involvement allow them to share? Who is the custodian of this book? How do we coexist on this page? How can we reimagine custodianship? Is this an agreement or a series of unanswered questions? Are you willing to enter an agreement that is incomplete and subject to change? Well, you've put that to the reader. We will see how many of those signed treaties we'll see hashtagged throat on all social media platforms. I'm just conscious of the time. We're going to have questions in a yeah. couple of minutes. I'd I just like want to have some questions, yeah. Good. I just thought we'd ask, um, I wanted to see a thumbs up from anybody who has ever drafted, deleted, recrafted, deleted again, and finally didn't send a text message because I'm one of those people, and Ellen has a great poem titled Unsent Text Messages that I think would be a great writing exercise for all of us. So I just wanted to flag that, and I don't know how many thumbs are going up there because I can't see everybody. And I also wanted to say that never let it be said that Ellen Van Nieuwen is not, Ellen Van Nieuwen is not on top of her soap operas because she even mentions Brooke and Ridge from Bold and the Beautiful in Throat. I kid you not. So on that note, I want to say congratulations, Ellen. Uh, I officially launch your amazing collection. I look forward to seeing it on bestseller list and seeing you win multiple awards uh, and lots of people wearing your T-shirt. But what we're going to do now is we're going to throw it open to questions. And I think Chrissy is going to ask those questions. Is that correct? Off you go, Chrissy. Correct. Uh, we, have a, we, we have quite a few questions here. We also have a comment which is um, pertinent. Nadine um, McDonald dowd has said, perhaps we should um, send a copy of our signed treaties to the PM. Um, quite a nice idea if um, they're inundated by the signed copies of treaties. Um, but there's also uh, a few other questions. One of them is, um, which, which was the section of the book that was hardest to write, Helen? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think the language section, which is speaking outside, um, I got this beautiful opportunity um, from the Red Room Company where we were going to do the translations of the poems. And I was, I was thinking, what am I going to say that I want to be uh, interpreted into Yugumbe? Like, you know, it, it changed how I was thinking to be able to sort of imagine the work being in a different language. Um, and I kind of thought, you know, if colonization hadn't happened, would I have anything to write about? Um, kind of imagining myself in, in, a, in a place and how, what my role would be in community um, before uh, colonization. 
Sorry, I just um, I lost the last word there, but that's okay. Um, um, there was just a little bit of a hitch on my end. Um, there's a there's a question here from Grace Helen. Um, Is that Grace Lucas Penning? It might just be who was actually going to um, pen a, a question that went um, for a page and a half, and that was from some white member of the audience um, and wanted to do a fake um, stand up and, and do a statement instead of a um, you know. Grace is so naughty. But very naughty. But instead, the real question is, um, uh, what what do you want the readers, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to take away from this book? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I want it to be, like, unlike any other reading experience. Is that, like, too, like, ambitious? I, I want it to be a different experience. I want it to kind of maybe provoke questions, um, but also to be enjoyable, you know, to sort of be... Some of these poems are for the people, you know, they're not just intellectual exercises, you know, it's like about kind of being there with me. Like Chomi has the, the voices of my mum and my auntie and my nana, and, you know, like, yeah, kind of a communal experience, I guess. Right. And there's also, um, there's a question here um, from Hannah Donnelly. Who Hi. is your biggest literary crush? Oh. <laughs> oh. What, what if I say you, Hannah? <laughs> or your boyfriend, or Masaka? Um, mm, so many. And I think a lot of you are on here. Um, can I just skip that question? Is that all right? <laughs> have, you got, have you got any... Um, I mean, you talked about some of the influences, I suppose, on your, um, mm. your work. Was there a, a book that um, was a particular... Um, mm crushed yeah. during the writing of this book? Uh, Claudia Rankin's Citizen, um, Nat Harkin's Archival Poetics, Charmaine Paper Talk Green's work, mm -hmm. whole body of work. Uh, yeah, First Nations poets, Janine, Janine Lane, beautiful poetry, very smart. Uh, Joy Harjo, uh, who's a First Nations woman from the States. Um, yeah, these these are kind of the aunties of this book, I guess. Yeah, and also just to remind people, Ellen, that at the back there's a series of notes which oh, yeah. yeah, with more recommended reading. So, you know, once you get to the end, you'll be able to get, see a whole lot of inspiration there and, and mm -hmm. opportunities to go forth and borrow from libraries and buy books from avid reader. I have a recommended reading list of, of books about whiteness, and Anita Heiss, Heiss's "Am I Black Enough for You" is on on that book as well uh, on that list as well as Aileen Morton Robinson's Talking Up to the White Woman, um, two must, must read books. We've got a question about your musical rather than literary influences. Does music um, influence your work? Mm -hmm. Well Aviva sent me a playlist, like a chill playlist to listen to before this to try and get myself in, in the mood um, which is really nice but I, I guess I listen to, my main thing is kind of more upbeat music, like I love Lizzo, like Lizzo always makes me happy. Um, yeah, and I kind of, yeah, I've been listening to, yeah, a lot of stuff, uh, but Lizzo's, Lizzo's a favourite. There's, um, there's quite a lot of just comments about how um, amazing um, your work is and how great it is to hear you um, speak. So I'm just passing that on to you. Um, but um, someone has asked if you um, do readings from your work. Um, uh, do you often do readings from your work? I suppose we're in a very different world now, so that it's, might be different mm, now. It's very different reading to the screen than it is. I love the in-person readings and the... It's such a buzz to sort of have everyone around and people reading and stuff. But hopefully, yeah, so it won't be too long before we can uh, respectfully social distance and, and still do reading events. Sure. Avid Reader is also hoping that when we're allowed to do um, in real life events again, um, that we have a, a mini festival of cancelled events as in festival a festival of the events that were cancelled in person and that we had to have via zoom so that we can actually have proper signing That's a great idea proper organization um so there's a question here from tamina pitt um who has said you spoke a lot about vulnerability and the importance of vulnerability between writer and reader how do you navigate being vulnerable to your audience particularly after that hsc incident 
Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, Maxine Beniba Clark has written a beautiful um, essay called On On Risk that I've read recently, and she says she goes into classrooms and all of the young women of color come up to her and they're like, "How do you do what you do? Aren't you scared? Aren't you scared like every every night that you know you're gonna people are gonna you know." Just things to you or, or try to hurt you because of what you do um so that kind of I think unfortunately we live in a society where um this kind of yeah trolling and that sort of stuff is just like so uh systemic um but I kind of made a pact with myself with this book that I wasn't going to hold back I was just gonna, like, I was like I, I I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to, you know, it would be uh, disrespectful to my mum, to my grandma, to uh, all these people that have come before me to take a backward step. And I'm going to write a book that uh, is not going to be afraid of uh, telling difficult truths and, um, you know, I think we all sh I think as writers sometimes we get we start thinking about you know like I have five projects in my head I'm like I want to do this and this and this but I had very much tunnel vision where I was like this could be the last book I write I wanted to give it all I got and I want to make it as perfect as possible you can't really make a book perfect but you know I was in that kind of headspace it's a, it's actually amazing I can attest to the fact that you have written a book which has power and there's anger there, but it's not an angry book. It's not a book that is shouting at people. It's a book that is powerfully talking to people and with people. So um, I think mm -hmm. you have put everything on the page without being, you know, without the fury being an uncontained thing. Mm -hmm. it's quite beautiful. Anger makes us sick. You know, we need to find an outlet, a healthy outlet for pain. And that's why I'm so kind of blessed to have writing. You do it with power, it's beautiful. Um, so there's a question here, where does your poetry come from? The heart, the head or the throat? Uh, this one was from the throat, 100%, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, there's a question um, from Sue Abbey that says, what's it like being at the, the front of Indigenous writing um, as you are? What, what does it feel like to kind of be at the, front. At the, at the head of a, a beautiful mm. boat? I don't really feel like I'm at the front. I feel like I would be somewhere towards the back, kind of <laughs> encouraging people. Um, there's so many of us now. It's it's so beautiful how many beautiful First Nations writers are, are publishing, and um, and um, mm, I feel a responsibility to make sure that there's space for other writers. That I don't like monopolize the space and keep bringing other writers forward. Um, I'm working with Aviva at the moment, we're uh, editing an anthology of short stories, um, which will hopefully like bring more, and I know from Aviva that there's, UKP has some exciting Indigenous books, Indigenous authors books coming out next year, so, you know, the more the merrier, you know. Yeah. There's a, a question here from the wonderful poet David Stavanger, mm. um, who says, can you do a live reading from Throat in the Chermi Food Court um, mm -hmm. later this year, please? <laughs> David, that's so funny because Overland asked me to um, tape me reading Chermi and I thought it would be really funny. You know, this was in the middle of the, you know, lockdown kind of thing. We weren't actually really meant to go outside, but somehow forced my mum, poor mum, to come with me to Chermi and I was like let's try and like record this in the food court and it was like it just the music was too loud from the speakers so then we tried another idea where I was in the car park and I was in a trolley and um, I was reading Chermi um, and she was taping me while I was in this like bright blue trolley I don't know why the trolley was bright, bright blue but we found it um, so we tried all these experiments and then at the end of the day we realized that just the plain me reading with a white background was better because you could hear me and I wasn't yeah even though it was kind of very camp and stuff I still I wish we still had the video of me and the trolley because I think it was really funny 
it was kind of like that Radiohead um, video clip, like for fake plastic trees, like it was that kind of feeling. Um, but yeah, it just didn't work <laughs> as well. <laughs> I, I really want to see you do a live reading in Chermi later. I think that we should organise that. We'll um, organise them to cut the music and then... then yeah, yeah, just come out through the... Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be good. All over the shopping centre. Um, there's a couple more questions, which I'll really quickly run through because I do want to get to um, uh, back to Anita because there is a book giveaway that we'll talk about at the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So um, there's a question here about um, how you negotiate, negotiate or choose your storytelling method. So whether you're um, talking through poetry or through short stories or fiction or non-fiction, um, mm. is there an obvious um, way through to choose what, how to use a method. I, lo I love that I can use more than one um, and I'm actually really grateful to have started writing plays as well so to get some experience like uh, Andrea's on this chat we, we work together on a on a play at, uh, with Mughalan, um for development and um, that's how uh, I got to know Annie Cole um, and Nadine at QPAC um, because we were also uh, a part of the Sparks program. So playwriting, fiction, non-fiction, poetry. I think I choose whichever feels, I feel like I have an idea and then I choose the form that best suits the idea. And sometimes it's like doing a lot of uh, reading or watching other people do their work or, and then seeing, oh, actually I can kind of, I can be inspired by that. You know, that's how I became a poet. And I still feel like I'm an emerging poet, but I read a lot of poetry. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. I want to write a narrative poem, or I want to write a prose poem, or I want to write a haiku, or whatever it might be, like sort of adopting that form because I think it's going to work with the content. Okay, I'm going to share with everybody now um, the um, giveaway. So um, just watch your screens. Here is. Um, here is the message. Thanks to UQP, we've got a single copy of Throat to Give Away. Um, so that'll be after you buy one through Avid Reader. Um, so you just go to the link that um, Chrissy is sharing and tell us in 25 words or less why you need a copy of Throat in your home library. And um, that closes on May 28. And Ellen will judge that and I'll post it out as soon as she announces a winner. So okay. thanks to you pay for that and if, if we can actually we don't have to social distance so much by then i'll ellen and i will catch up and i'll get her to sign the book to you as well so here is a link to purchase the book again i have been sharing it but there's been a lot of chatter so here's here's the link again to purchase the book from avid oh, maddie hi maddie um, we are going to, um, before we finish tonight, we're going to open the floor so that people can um, applaud. And when we do that, it becomes a cacophony and I, I just have to end the meeting from there because um, there's no way to get it back. Um, it basically devolves into um, a cacophony. So before I do that, um, I'd like to thank everybody who's spoken tonight. So thank you, Annie Cole, for that acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Aviva, for your wonderful speech. And of course, my dear friend, Ellen, and my dear friend, Anita Heiss, thank you so much for that conversation. It was wonderful. We have recorded the conversation and we have a YouTube channel, which um, we are now uploading um, these videos to. So if you go to Avid Reader's YouTube channel, you'll be able to um, see previous events and in hopefully a few days, you'll be able to see um, the event tonight um, again and relive it. Um, and I'm also going to give um, Ellen a copy of um, the chat. So if you do have more things to say to Ellen um, do put them in chat now and although I can't share them with everyone and I was sharing everyone's um, where they were meeting from and what country they were from but I was sharing them to everyone in the waiting room rather than the meeting room before so nobody got to see that long list that I um, diligently put up on the screen because they went to the waiting room but today um, now I can I can actually um, record all your messages and I'll send those to Ellen. So please feel free to put your messages here and I'm just about to unmute you all. So is there any last words that Ellen you'd like to say before I unmute everybody? Any last words? No, before it's just so lovely to see you all. I 
want to spend i want to like i wish we could like be on here longer <laughs> like this is so good to see everyone um thank you so much congratulations ellen thank you, thank thank you. you. let's all clap yeah. i'm on I haven't got it. Yay. <laughs> I know I'm not <laughs> I'm not I know I messed up I was cooking stuff, so it was just better to not have and I the it was lovely. It's seen um party time, Alan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Congrats, Alan. Thank you. Congratulations. Congrats. Well done. <laughs> Well, this is on the beach, that's actually on the beach, but it was just in the way. Linda. Uh, love you, Ellen. Oh, hello, Nelly. It's so good to see you, sister. We're all here, we're all saying hi. Hey. Hey. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Sue. So much love to all of you. Thank you. Can't wait till we see each other in real life. Hi, Julie. What background do you have, Julie? You look like you're in a garden. It's um, Studio Ghibli. Sorry, Eddie. <laughs> you look like you're underwater. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I do. Hi, Laura. Hello from the ditch. Over the ditch, Laura. Hello. <laughs> Oh, uh, hello, V. Oh, the war dogs of Maria. Likewise, good to see you, my sister. Hello, Faith. Hello, sis. How are you? Good to see you back. Oh, wow. And I walk past Oh, Congratulations. Hi. Congratulations. Hi.